So without further ado, our speakers for tonight uh, are Scott Whitlin, who is our labor and employment specialist. He's a partner at Barnes Thornburg LLP in Los Angeles. We're very glad to have him here tonight on the West Coast. Also joining us a little further north on the West Coast is Karen Nadler uh, from the office of Karen Nadler. She is a data security and privacy attorney who I've known for many years. And I'm very thrilled to have Karen with us tonight. Uh, and finally, we have, uh, as I mentioned already, our tax specialist, Jason Wiggum. Jason is a partner at Wiggum and Gear here in Atlanta, uh, which is a growing tax practice and now a bankruptcy arm as well added on to it. Uh, I got his mailer, I think it was earlier today. So welcome to all of our panelists. And uh, with, thank you also, I want to say thank you so much to Ginger Tantavitong and Andrew Greenberg, uh, the Georgia Game Developers Association and Asifa South for believing in this panel and trusting me to bring them experts and in trusting our vision to deliver important information to you. If you know people who can't be here tonight, but you know that they would benefit from this information, Please know and let them know that this will be a video on demand that we will publish to the YouTube channel. My understanding is there uh, session number one is already available. So you can go to the ASIFA South channel and watch session one also if you missed that. So let's get into the talk. We thought that the most logical progression of this discussion would be to start with Scott. Scott's practice is in labor and employment. Scott, would you like to have a casual conversation with me about the new norm? What is the new norm yeah. and talk about working from home, returning to work? What is this? How are you seeing this come up in your practice? Yeah, well, you know, this is the new norm, right? We're here. Um, where each of us are home, we're on. Uh, this is a, a Google uh, uh, video conference. Today I've been on a Zoom, a Google, a WebEx, and it Microsoft Meets. I've had uh, all of them running at various times today on, on my computer. And it is kind of the new norm. And, and, um, and the question, I guess, is how long is this gonna last? And is it ever gonna go back to the way it was back in the olden days? Um, you know, and, and I think we got to take a step back and look at where we are and, you know, sort of, you know, as a, as a person who can work from home, count our blessings. You know, there were a lot of people when, you know, the society shut down whose jobs basically went away for at least some period of time. People in the service industries, a lot of hotel employees, restaurant employees, uh, factory workers who weren't working for uh, essential industries, and they weren't able to work. Um, and, you know, there were, I forget what the total was, but there was tens of millions of people who were unemployed. Um, you know, as, as somebody who is an attorney, I was lucky because I'm able to, to work at least somewhat. You know, our courts are mostly closed, our, so we're not, you know, working as many hours as we were before. And, you know, everyone loves attorneys because we bill by the, uh, the tenth of an hour. Um, and so if you're not working, you're not making as much money, but at least we're making something. And um, I'm sure there are people all in between, people who are working full time. And, you know, it's really uh, a, a very different kind of thing. And, and you know, uh, Lee, I think when we started talking about this, you were surprised that I had a view that, you know, for people who could work from home, that it wasn't always as easy as people who got to go back to work. And I think some of it is oh, the grass is always greener. Um, I have noise canceling headphones on, but I can still hear in the background my seven month old daughter crying in her bedroom as she's trying to fight taking a nap. And for a lot of people working from home, that's a big challenge for them. I saw a study that said 60% of the people who were trying to telework were having a hard time juggling work and children. And, you know, I've got an infant that's uh, its own unique set of issues. But for a lot of parents who had kids who were supposed to be um, 
in school or who would have been in school, but now we're trying to take online classes and do online learning and had to, you know, basically babysit them, help them get online and make sure they actually were doing that instead of watching whatever it was they were going to be watching on the internet. God only knows. Um, you know, that was its own set of challenges. Um, you know, and there's in LA, I think two thirds of the kids didn't log in on uh, for school at all on some days. Um, the statistics were just really abysmal. And I think I've spoken to clients all across the country and they've had incredibly varying experiences. Some of them, their kids have been locked in, they've been doing their work the whole time. Uh, other kids, uh, you know, have had at most like an hour or two of school a day. Um, I have my a, a 16 or 17 year old niece who's in middle school or I guess she's now in high school in Orange County, California. And basically her description was uh, one of her teachers hadn't logged in in five weeks to update his assignments. But a lot of her other teachers were giving them work, you know, every day or every week and they had plenty of school. So really there's been a variety of things. In addition, some people just don't have the space. Uh, I'm sitting here at my dining room table because my office is not yet completed. And I've been sitting here at my dining room table pretty much for six or not, for 16 weeks now. Um, and fortunately, uh, there's not two of us working at home because there wouldn't be room for two of us working at home. So there's a whole lot of challenges. Um, when we go back, and go back to the office as, as cities start to open up. I'm here in LA where we are not yet open and I, I expect we probably won't, you know, the city won't really open up till God knows when. I was just on the phone with um, a couple of law firm administrators. I'm gonna be putting on a program about going back to work in two weeks. One of them says that they're not even anticipating going back to work until September. Uh -huh. um, and as these cases come through and the administrators who have to make sure the workplace is set up properly, that there's social distancing, that there's hand washing facilities, that there's adequate spacing, there's new traffic flow patterns, there's you know barriers if people can't be physically separated sufficiently, you have to have elevator access to pr programs, all of that stuff. They're now telling me that they're getting additional notifications from their landlords that other tenants in the building have had new COVID cases and you know they're trying to figure out when it's going to be safe and they have to deal with the issue of employees who may have rational or somewhat irrational fears about coming back to work. Um, so there's all sorts of challenges that people have. And, and hey, Scott, I'd you know, love for it, you to talk about yeah. the. I'd love for you to. I'd love to hear more about this rational versus irrational because I think this is a, a conversation I've had with one of my own clients, um, and he uh, was uh, convinced that his employees were happier um, making that federal uptick and that they were making more. And this is a conversation we had in session one where there was almost an incentive not to go to work because you're making more off of unemployment with the federal uptick, which ends at the end of July, uh, than you were going back to work. But now uh, when he said that, of course, I'm thinking all possible reasons. And one of the reasons, of course, that maybe uh, he didn't consider was uh, the risk of illness and uh, maybe I'm a carrier and maybe I'm protecting someone in my house who might be susceptible. So there's that, is it rational or is it irrational? And at what point does an employee have to make a decision or an employer have to make a decision and, and what can they do at this stage to prepare for that situation um, is there a law that can protect them or some type of uh, way to prepare either side? Well, you know, the, uh, the federal benefit, right, the unemployment assistance benefit, which is the $600 a week uh, add-on to unemployment insurance, was a compromise. I think the White House was against it for the very reasons that people are suffering now, which is it's an impediment for people coming back to work. There are people who want to have their workers come back and the workers are very happy collecting more money on unemployment, not working. 
then they are then they would be making money working and because they're not stupid right if you're going to pay somebody not to work as much or more or maybe even almost as much or more they you know a lot of people are going to say i'd rather stay at home not commute not have any risk and collect the check and you know there's a lot of people who fall into that category other people you know want to get out of the house because it drives them crazy to be in the same room all the time. And, you know, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, you know, in a little while, you're not going to have to stay home in your own room because the cities are going to be opened up and you're going to be, or the, you know, the towns where you live are going to be opened up and you won't be really locked down. And so if you don't have to go to work and you're not locked down, you've got a lot of freedom. And if you're making money doing that, a lot of people are going to do that. Um, but in terms of fear, you know, a lot of people are in different categories, right? So, and we're learning more and more. There was a Stanford uh, doctor who just announced, you know, basically said that if you're under 45, your risk from COVID of mortality is very small. You know, and under 30, it's up next to zero. So, you know, the number of people who die from COVID who are under 30 is really quite small compared to other risks. Um, if you're over, you know, if you're over 65, it's a completely different story. And if, you know, assuming no underlying health conditions, if you have, if you're immunocompromised, if you've got respiratory issues, if you're diabetic, um, Siri just went off on my computer. I'm not exactly sure what I said, but if you're any of those things, obviously you're at greater risk than the average individual. And I think you don't know, and you don't know who people are living with, right? So someone's spouse could be immune compromised or they could have some kind of respiratory illness and they are legitimately afraid to, to bring that back in the house. Now the law, you know, the laws that have been passed protect the employee for the employee's own illness and um, under, you know, the new Families First Act, you have protection to, you know, take time off to take care of your kids if they're out of school or if their child care has been impacted. Although the IRS threw a nice monkey wrench if your kids are teenagers, because, you know, the IRS seems to think that if the kids are teenagers, they can take care of themselves during daylight hours and you don't get the Family First leave. Um, and it gives you uh, two weeks of leave to take care of yourself if you get COVID or if you suspect that you're getting COVID or you've been given a quarantine order or if you need time to take a test. But after those two weeks, you, and, you, know, you don't get any time off and you don't get any time off to take care of somebody else who's ill. Now, if you're concerned because you yourself have some particular vulnerability you're immune compromised, you have some lung condition. You know, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA kicks in and there's gonna be some need for employers to have some kind of interactive process to deal with you. But a lot of these, you know, issues and the leave really deals with your ability, your inability to work or telework. So if you're an office worker and you're teleworking and you're able to telework, you don't get the leave. So you have to continue to work. Um, so there are those, you know, there are a variety of issues. And then it gets down to sort of an employee relations issue. As an employer, what are your, um, what are your uh, interests in terms of both your, your uh, values as an employer and your interest in maintaining the workforce, which you know, having a skilled workforce and a trained workforce is, is a valuable asset to an employer. Are you going to, you know, bend against the cost of maintaining employees either on a paid basis or on an unpaid leave? Because even employees on unpaid leave frequently will get benefits. Um, and there are costs to that. And if you're in a business that's healthy, you know, a lot of, a lot of businesses actually did quite well during the lockdown. You know, grocery stores, um, you know, online delivery businesses, Amazon certainly wasn't hurting. They were hiring hundreds of, you know, 100,000 people. They're gonna do, you know, they may be quite uh, healthy and they're gonna be able to spend some money and be generous with people. 
other businesses, you know, are hurting. So, you know, if you were shut down for a long period of time or you couldn't operate at full capacity, even a restaurant, let's say, where basically you can't operate because you're at some kind of uh, seating capacity or, or occupancy limits and you've got to socially distance and you can only serve 25% or 30% of your normal customers, you might not be able to make it with additional costs of carrying employees. And so there's a whole a, host of things. So I have a yeah. question for those of us, um, for the for those in the audience who operate on contracts and who don't have the comfort of an employment agreement or the benefits. Um, for those freelancers or, um, you know, the work made for hire situations, people who um, sell their services, like, yes, they have a home office or a home studio, but um, they might offer their services online. Um, what if they get sick? Um, is there anything that they can do maybe uh, as, as, as straightforward as maybe an extra statement in their contract um, that they might be able to uh, ask their lawyer uh, to consider? Um, you know, we have those force majeure clauses um, that we see from time to time when there's an act of God or something beyond their control. But when it comes to the turnaround time on a project, I want to say because of the distance, we're seeing a lot of lag in getting those projects done. Uh, we talked about editing last week. Um, so, you know, when you're not in the same room uh, with the people that you need to be in the same room with normally. So for these contractors, is there any language that they might need to, to consider when there's uh, for their contracts or asking asking their lawyers or the person hiring them, um, what if you know? Do we need to consider a suspension period? What would be the terminology that they need to reference? Yeah, you know, I think it's all it's all going to vary. I mean, there's a bunch of different ways you could do it, right? I mean, one of the things is working as a freelancer is inherently risky, right? Um, I, I always think of the Godfather. This is the life we have chosen, right? Um, you know, freelancers actually have done a little bit better um, under this set of circumstances because there's, you know, there was there was benefits for independent contractors as part of as part of the CARES Act that you know previously weren't in existence. So you could apply for benefits whereas you previously couldn't. But generally, basically, you're a self-employed person, the same way any entrepreneur is, and so. You know, you've got to provide for yourself and you've got to be able to, you know, bridge those downturns. Now, can you get a, you know, can you get a, an advance payment or a bonus for signing the contract? You know, those are going to be issues that you're going to have to try to negotiate up front to get some, some things, you know, but probably, you know, you're probably being paid over time or you're going to be paid on delivery. That's a lot of, you know, as a lot of people are. And those are, those are difficult things. You know, the force majeure provisions, usually it's an option, right? So uh, if one party declares a force majeure, so it's usually the, the purchaser declares the force majeure that they have the right to extend, you know, it's usually suspend and extend the contract. So they have the right of terminating it or s suspending and extending it. And with you know, with on-air talent or voice talent or something like that, where you're established in a game or you're established in a animated series, you know, you probably have some leverage because um, it's going to be hard to replace you because they may have to replace everybody, you know, everything you've already done. It, in film, it's even harder. Um, if you haven't started yet, it may be easier for them to just go, okay, we have a schedule we have to meet, you know, um, it, it all depends, you know, game development is a little bit, a little bit easier in some ways than film development because the, the, the time scales are so extended. You know, if you're working on a game that's got a three year time horizon and Andrew's kind of looking at me like, yeah, that's right. Yeah. If you've got a three year time horizon and you have to push back recording for three months, it probably won't kill your whole schedule. Now, if you're trying to ship your game in September because you've got the Christmas holiday and this is the three months where you need to get stuff, stuff done, I've got clients that are going crazy because there's stuff they were trying to pick up and add to the game 
and they can't, you know, they can't find a place where they can do their performance capture to get some additional footage because how do you have people interact with one another and socially distance? You know, VO is easier because people, a lot of people will have a booth in their own house like you do, Lee. Um, or, you know, you can bring one person into a booth and they're socially distanced and you disinfect the booth before they come and you disinfect it after right. they're gone and you can get the work done. But, you know, things are hard. I was dealing with a client today that had trying to figure out what to do because they had picked up some additional footage in Canada because somehow British Columbia w was operating and they were able to get some performance capture done in Canada and they're trying to integrate it with a game that was mostly produced in the United States. Um, you know, flip side is so, I've got a client that just started production on, mo on two, on two uh, I think they're, they're probably uh, streaming films, but they started production, which is a lot better than we are in LA. And I that's actually a, a great- for, Go ahead, for Andrew. One thing I recommend for contractors in the game industry while we do have broad deadlines, we do usually have a pipeline. So I need to get my assets to someone else at some point. So I can't be too delayed. But right. I will still recommend the contractors have a cure period in their contract. So if they miss a deadline for illness or whatever, have 30 days, 15 days, one week, have some period to cure before the uh, repercussion clauses kick in. Right. That's a great suggestion, Andrew. And um, and Scott, last question. Um, you talked about, you know, productions. And for those who are returning to work or returning to an office or returning to an on location or whatever their situation is, we've seen in the news a lot of guidelines. People are putting out, you know, private studios are putting out their guidelines. Uh, state governments, uh, Brian Kemp put out his state guidelines, and then there's national guidelines, there's OSHA guidelines, there's uh, labor union guidelines. So where does one look? At who's Who's got the authority and what would be the best practice for um, making sure that not only are you following the guidelines, but your employer or whoever's hiring you is adhering to the guidelines so you know when you're safe? Yeah. Oh, I, and know, let's not mess. forget the CDC. I mean, there's so many layers, right? Right. So it's a, it's a mess. So um, one of the reasons why we're having issues in LA with, with um, well, there's a lot of reasons for different things, but for law firms, for instance, is we've got guidelines from the CDC. We've got the state regulations. We have LA County regulations and LA city regulations. Um, and then, you know, say for motion picture and just the motion picture industry, they've got all of those things. And depending on where they are, they may fall under different guidelines. And then they have the industry promulgated guidelines for, for California. You know, there's a different set of guidelines for the, you know, Georgia Film Commission, um, just for example. Uh, it's very difficult. And as an employer, what I tell the employers are monitor the guidelines. Most of the time, they will tell you, you should be doing what makes common sense under this rubric of things, and then document what you're doing. And by the way, those guidelines change periodically. So you have to keep on monitoring what's going on. And if you're going to change, if the guidelines have changed, you probably want to change what you're doing to comply. You know, For instance, there was a period of time where they, they were unclear about face coverings. By the way, they're still unclear about face coverings. I was trying to figure out today whether or not a face shield is, is compliant with the guidelines. Uh. And I can tell you, you can't tell what the guidelines say because they talk about face coverings and then some places they talk about cloth face coverings. So then I wanted to look up you know, what was, what does the medical community say about face shields, you know, the clear plastic shields and the medical community is split on it. And some places say, yeah, it's not as good because we don't think it's going to be as comfortable, which doesn't mean it's not as good. It just means, you know, for some people it won't be as comfortable. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, but anyway, let's say they come up with a guideline that says, Face shields are better than cloth coverings. 
masks and everybody should wear face shields. Well, then you're going to want to document that you've changed your policy and you're going to want to document why you've changed your policy and when. Because at some point, somebody's going to claim you weren't doing what you should have been doing. And now you're going to basically have to go back and you're never going to be able to recreate the facts if you're not keeping a log. Well, this so is basically what the change it's... was and this is why we adopted it. Um, so right. basically it's, uh, um, so basically it's like, uh, keeping up and just making sure you CYA documenting everything and checking up on, uh, guidelines that affect you. It's a lot of extra work. It sounds like, but as they say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We hope, um, I know that in the city of Atlanta, a lot of cities are and localities are considering making what you said, face coverings, masks, I just call them masks. Uh, I know that's a more specific term than in face covering. Um, but again, you know, a mask could be your eyes. It could be your mouth, right? Um, we understand mask right now to be your mouth and your nose, um, but they're considering making them mandatory. And what's interesting there is I, about a month ago, uh, when we saw a lot of folks out in our city not wearing anything, uh, especially downtown where I am, where there's a lot of population density. Um, we've been uh, tweeting to the mayor because she's pretty responsive on Twitter. Um, and she's also a fellow attorney uh, saying, uh, don't you think it's a, a good idea to uh, enforce this policy? But then you have to consider what is the likelihood people will obey it? What is the likelihood that people will go along with it? And the reality, in my opinion, is People don't go along with a law unless somebody gets hurt, unless they see there's somehow a benefit for themselves. And now the mayor is sick. The mayor has COVID. Um, she got it earlier this week. And, uh, and so now we have this mandatory policy coming in. I think it was to come in yesterday or today, um, a city ordinance. Um, but what she said was she just didn't want to task the police to enforce another law when they're already so... Uh, apparently overstretched. So it's just a really tense time, I think, for a lot of folks. And um, and I just want to thank you for sharing your thoughts tonight. Um, we got a lot of good information out of you. And for anybody uh, who has more questions, we'll have some Q&A at the end for Scott. And we'll also, uh, of course, have everybody's uh, contact information as well. Um, I hate to cut the conversation on labor and employment because we could go on all night, um, but I have to move to uh, Karen, Karen, uh, who handles data security and privacy. Would you please tell our audience members who aren't knowledgeable, what is it that you do? What is privacy law and why is it important? Great question. So privacy law feels like a very new area of the law in the United States. It's only come to into prominence, it's coming into its own recently in the recent years. But it's basically um, any laws that deal with the regulation or storage or use of personally identifiable information. Um, it could mean um, HIPAA laws, that's one example of privacy law in the healthcare realm. And there are financial services laws. Um, so we have a very patchwork quilt kind of um, privacy laws, plural, in the United States. Um, in Europe, in, in contrast, you may have heard of the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation. And that is based upon the European um, very strongly held feeling that privacy is a fundamental human right. And so they have a broad, all-encompassing law to cover that. And so I'm curious then, um, because we talked about privacy law earlier, and you said that it's uh, got a lot of moving parts and it's it's sometimes, it, like you said, it's a patchwork. So um, what is what is the best, what is the reasonable risk rule? And can you explain that uh, within the context of, of how it would apply in a workplace environment? Yeah, sure thing. So um, let's just start with a little bit of background. There's a California privacy law, which started um, it became effective January 1st of this year and became um, enforceable as of July 1st. So it's very, very recent law. It's called the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act. And then there's also another big one that you hear a lot about. I just mentioned the GDPR out of Europe. Um, 
Both of those require that businesses use quote unquote reasonable security. So that's not, not very helpful. You know, what is reasonable? What could be reasonable in one situation may not be reasonable in another situation. Um, so what, the, what it means is that a business, or if you get to the point of going to court, um, a court would have to decide um, what is an objective standard for how a reasonably prudent person would behave under similar circumstances. So um, all of this haziness over what's reasonable and what's not, just be thankful that the law doesn't require state-of-the-art security. <laughs> so when you, when you compare it with that, you can see reasonable security gives you some room to wiggle a little bit and to say, um, maybe we're dealing with personal data of one kind, but maybe we're not dealing with sensitive personal information. Um, and so there are different levels of security that you would comply with. So I've actually seen this come up in uh, cl with clients who do business online, and maybe they have a, an e-commerce or a storefront, or really what seems a, so harmless, they might have a contact form, or mm -hmm. you know some way where they're inviting uh, members of the public um, to to use their website to gain information off their website, and then to give them information. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people doing business, freelancers, small businesses, especially now that we're all at home, you know, the new norm, why is, when should they be concerned and in what context are they actually uh, playing a role in this whole data security and privacy, maybe without even realizing it? Yeah, so this is a really fact specific question. Um, one of the things that's important to be aware of is that the GDPR, although it's a European law, has extraterritorial effect. So there may be some cases in which even a local Georgia um, company may have to be concerned with GDPR. California CCPA has the same, um, well, it's, it's very similar in that it has some extraterritorial impact. Um, it's important to just sit down and, and make an analysis of what personal data you keep. What are you asking for? What are you holding? How long are you holding it? For what purpose do you have it? Do you have a legal reason to hold it in the first place? Um, hopefully you only keep it as long as it needs to be held. And when, it's, when the, the life cycle is finished, how do you securely destroy that personal data to make sure that there's no further risk after that point? These are all things you'll do with an attorney. What if I had a website where people could create accounts, like mm -hmm. user accounts, and then they could maybe post comments, like a blog even. Mm -hmm. um, these are, of course, slightly more sophisticated websites. Um, or what if I took people's money? Um, I mean, both of these situations, I might have um, a shop. Um, is it, you know, are these concerns that would put me at risk for holding on to personal data um, unless maybe I was to, um, you know, in, in, it would just posting a privacy policy protect me? So in some ways, a privacy policy can protect you, but it, what, it's very important not to just copy one off of some website. The most important thing a privacy policy can do is be a reflection of the true reality of what you do with personal data. So uh, one company may say, we do this and this and this with our data. You might, might handle things a completely different way. You can both have good privacy policies as long as they're accurate. It needs to be accurate reflection of what you're doing with the data. And, and would a privacy policy um, typically go hand in hand with other policies? Like if I had a, a, a website and that was my chief way of doing business or selling my services, um, you know, I know that a lot of uh, freelancers or independent contractors or small businesses have social media sites, right? Where mm -hmm. now these days you can actually purchase uh, or you can shop for services through Facebook, which is interesting. Um, you can even collect data through Facebook, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that there's some secondary layer of liability there, but say I had a website, um, would I be okay with just a privacy policy? Is there anything else I might be, be needing in order to yeah. feel safe? Very often that goes hands in hand with terms of use. So usually, especially where you have um, 
users coming in with their own opinions. They may be doing blogging. They may be commenting. It's important to know what they can and cannot do. So for most companies, I would say, um, you know, there can't be any discussion of pornographic material. So that would be a standard thing. Now, on the other hand, I have one client who happens to be a porn company. So in their terms of use, they don't say you can't add anything that is obscene materials. So it, it all just has to be in keeping with whatever the business is actually doing. And I think just before we move on from this topic, I think I'd like, and I'm sure Karen would agree with me that this is the particular situation where you need to contact a lawyer who specializes in uh, e-commerce, privacy law, um, to write a custom tailored privacy policy, terms of use, if you're selling things, maybe a terms of sale, um, and make sure that you define your audience. So if you're soliciting matter, like Karen said, in another territory, like uh, if you're expecting customers from Europe that you're, you're hiring an attorney who knows the GDPR and can draft a policy that is compliant with those demands. And, and, and it's not just the documentation, it's the implementation, you know? Right. And Karen, do you wanna talk? I mean, I, I don't wanna spend too much time on this, but the implementation, you know, we've all seen licenses where you click through them, you check a box, uh, or, you know, maybe you see a website where it's just like this tiny print at the very bottom of the page and you almost have to get a magnifying glass to find it. Yeah. Obviously, so the, really click, the click through license is obviously what you want, that interactive component, um, because then, uh, and some go so far as making you scroll all the way through the document yeah. before you can click the box. But, yeah. um, but this is the particular situation you hire a lawyer. It pays to hire a lawyer. It's never a problem until it's a problem. And especially now that so much business is going to be done online, uh, the 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 risk is uh, huge. Um, so moving on to BYOD, talk about what is BYOD and in the context of your practice, where does it arise? Okay, so BYOD stands for bring your own device. And it's a lovely policy for some. It has advantages and it has disadvantages. But basically, companies realize that everyone already has their own cell phone. Everyone already has their own laptop. Why are they going to the trouble of issuing new ones for, the, um, for all the employees? Um, so they said, you know, bring your own device, but you have to do it within certain parameters. And some companies have policies on what those parameters are that are written, which is very nice if they're written down and everyone can see them and agree to them. Um, some of them, smaller organizations usually, have kind of a loosey-goosey kind of like, well, you can use your own device, but just don't put this kind of app on your, on your phone. Um, so it's a real advantage to, um, to employers for that cost savings, and it's a real advantage to an employee or a subcontractor who doesn't have to juggle so many different devices for each one of their clients. So I've benefited from that in the past. And um, I was at a company where it was up to me to decide, bring your own device or not. And I decided that I was going to, I was done going crazy with different devices for different clients. And I used just my home device and everything was working, moving along great. But um, one of the things I agreed to at the time was that if there were too many password attempts on my phone, that the employer could actually wipe clean my whole cell phone. And unfortunately with children touching my phone all the time, I was um, in a position where there were too many login attempts. And sure enough, my employer wipes clean my cell phone. And so I lost two years worth of children's photos and videos. So there are, there are downsides to bring your own device because you really have to play nicely with the employer and make sure that the employer um, keeps their security to the same level they want. Another small example would be something like um, security path pins on your phone. Normally we use four digit pins. Most people I know use four digit pins. Microsoft, for example, when it has contractors, um, just demands the use of six digit pins. So they're just little things to think of and, and be aware of. 
So I guess these are great bits of advice for if you're a contractor, right? Uh, make sure you back up your phone data all the time to a cloud, or uh, if you're an yeah. Apple user, you can automatically uh, throw everything into the cloud that matters to you as you're taking it, um, photos especially. Um, but obviously, uh, you know, the backups are great advice, but are they followed? I'm sure many of us forget from time to time. So um, from the employer side though, you know, if I'm, if I'm gonna hire contractors or um, if I'm doing a game and, uh, or, or if I'm, you know, running a small studio and I, and I wanna take on a, a bigger job and I know I'm gonna be taking some risks, especially now that we're all working from home and working by distance, um, you know, how can I create a safe work environment so that um, I can be sure that, um, you know, there's, there's, there's no security breaches. I mean, is, is this maybe a more esoteric question where um, how, are we, how are we all gonna be sure that we're not um, at risk of getting hacked or um, is, there, is there any best practices that you have for yes. working over a distance? Yes, I would say um, training is really key. I've recently implemented training at a, um, one of my clients' businesses, and um, it's a tech company, so they think that they know everything already about security. <laughs> and it's still important. It's still, even for the most sophisticated um, users of devices, it's important that the training be, um, the policy be written, it be reviewed and signed by each employee or contractor as they're onboarded. And then that the uh, training happen at least once annually. And what kind of policies? I love I love laundry lists of policies, especially when we get into uh, employer employee relationships or uh, employer contractor relationships, because there's so many policies out there. Uh, so in your case, what would be the chief most important policies that I might expect to have to sign or to train? Um, or on the other side that I need to have in order to protect myself? So the first thing would be a general information security policy. Um, a second one would be a privacy policy. Another would be a work from home policy, which can kind of um, is tangential to the BYOD policy. <laughs> is that enough policies for you? <laughs> so I love work from home because that's perfectly on point with tonight's topic. Is the work from home policy something that just got created because of COVID or has that been around for a while? Great question. So uh, for some companies, it's been around for a while. For one of my clients, they had already instituted a work from home policy where it was, I think a year ago, it was uh, everyone was to work from home at least one day a week. And then they expanded it and it was two days a week. And then COVID happens and everybody was already set up. And it worked perfectly. So they haven't written down their work from home policy per se, but they that's the policy that they led with, that they, um, they emailed all of their um, employees and said, you know what we've been doing, you know how we've been doing it, now it's just gonna be all the time. I, we actually have a quick question, if I may, and then I'm gonna switch over to tax, but um, I guess I should be paying attention to the chat window. Um, let's see, someone wants to know really quick, um, how do companies protect employee data uh, when HR is working from home? So your human resources who are obviously gonna have um, the really sensitive personal information, um, what do they do in that case if I'm, a, if I'm on the HR staff and I have to work from home? Yeah, that's a whole other level of risk, isn't it? Um, so I think for human resources uh, and privacy is really its own subgenre or subtopic. Um, so you have instances where you're collecting information from your employees and they have to provide that information for you to pay them, for example, a social security number. There's other information which they may take from you for various reasons, maybe health information. There may be things that they're collecting from you that you don't want to give. And so the question is, is there consent? Did the employee really consent to give the employer the information? 
when they feel they have to anyway for their job? Is it really meaningful consent? So things get definitely sticky in the area of um, human resources and uh, personal data. All right. Um, thank you so much, Karen, for your time. And if we did, uh, if you have additional questions, we'll definitely open up the floor in uh, 15 minutes uh, to more questions. And you're welcome to ask Karen another question if you like. Um, for now, we're going to switch from data security and privacy over to tax, everybody's favorite topic. We saved the best for last. Um, Jason. I'd like, uh, Jason and I talked a couple weeks ago about some uh, interesting topics that people may be considering currently. And bef we're going to, we're going to finish with next week, but right now I'd love to talk with you, Jason, about transitions. Um, people in this country are going through a lot of transitions with their income and their work status. Um, you know, some folks are being furloughed. Uh, some people are being laid off permanently. Uh, others are deciding that the risk, it might be too great for them and they need to switch careers. They're looking for jobs. Or some of them might say, to heck with working for someone else, I'm gonna take up my hobby and make it into a career. So talk about how can people prepare themselves for these big, uh, uh, I guess, are they taxable events or are they just like, uh, they trigger obviously changes in income. So that has to, that has to mean something with regard to taxes. So um, what is the best way to prepare for something like this? Yeah, so, you know, if, if someone was previously an employee and they're now, you know, switching into like a self-employed role, independent contractor role, um, you know, they're going to go from a system that sort of takes care of most of the work for them. Um, your employer withholds income taxes for you. You know, your Social Security and Medicare gets taken out of your paycheck and, you know, is paid into the system for you. You know, it, it's it's sort of like the easy button of taking care of your taxes, right? But when you're self-employed, the responsibility falls with the taxpayer. And, um, you know, no one's there to, to, to back you up. You have to do it yourself. You have to hire a professional. And, um, you know, unfortunately, if you don't do that, you end up having to hire someone like me um to help you resolve this tax problem that you have and you know i i genuinely wish no one has a tax problem it's not fun um but you know, the first thing you got to wrap your head around is every dollar of income you earn some percentage of that is uncle sam's and and state governments and possibly the city governments depending on where you live um you have to pay it to them but you know they're gonna come find you at some point in the future if you don't so it's better to you know voluntarily pay it in um when you're self-employed um you know you, depending on the amount of income you, make, you might not owe income taxes you know you have to earn you know 12 to 15 thousand dollars before income taxes come into play but with self-employment taxes the first dollar you earn is taxed at 12.4 percent um, so self-employment taxes, Social Security and Medicare um, apply right away. They're, they're regressive. They're not progressive. Um, when you're an employee, you pay them. Um, you know, you, you just pay less of it. The employer pays half and um, you pay half. When you're self-employed, you pay all of it and you take care of on your, your income tax return. Um, and the other big thing is you pay um, self-employment tax and income tax on your net income. So I think a lot of people, you know, that are entrepreneurs or who become self-employed, you know, just start doing what they're good at and, you know, they don't keep great records. So when it comes time to figure out what you actually owe in taxes, it's a problem. You know, so I, I would say have good record keeping out the gate. Um, you know, don't commingle your personal expenses and your business expenses. You know, get a separate business bank account, a separate business credit card. It makes keeping track of this and accounting for everything later much better. And you you do want to account for your 
taxes because it will reduce what you owe the government, right? And, you know, I think it's rational to want to pay as little as possible in taxes. Um, so that's that's kind of it, big picture. It's just, it's a different world if you're not into it. it it's not, it might sound difficult when I'm talking about it and really boring, but, um, you know, fortunately, when you opt in to self employed, that's what you get. Um, you know, so you can learn it, figure it out, or you, you'll end up paying someone like me, you know, a significant amount of money to solve the problem for you later. So I have a question about payroll. Um, for those who don't want to do the work, who want to hire someone else, a payroll company, um, Gusto, I have heard is kind of a DIY, do it yourself payroll service provider. Um, if, are you familiar with Gusto? Are there any competing applications? And with that, are there any legal requirements that I would need to make uh, as being self-employed in order to qualify for that service? Yeah, so if you're just an independent contractor, um, unless you make certain elections, you're not gonna have a salary and you couldn't even hire Gusto or any third party to handle it. So um, th this is what I do personally. I have an LLC to be taxed as what is called a subchapter S corporation. People refer to it as S corps frequently. So when you're an S corporation, um, you're required to pay yourself a salary. And so the reason you would want to pay yourself a salary is, you know, the taxes get taken out of your pay. And, you know, Gusto or ADP or any of these companies that will handle payroll and calculate the tax for you and handle all the filings, um, you know, we'll do that. Um, you know, but you have to take a couple steps before you get there if you're just a solo. Now, if you have employees, obviously you, you would want to engage one of these people to, to pay them to make sure you're doing it correctly. You know, and, and I think a lot of people deal with that solution by just paying their em employees as contractors I don't want to speak for Scott, but I, I think he'd probably tell you that's a really bad idea. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, but yeah, I, I've used Gusto. It, it, it's good. You know, it's definitely one that you, it's cheaper and the user has to do more work. Whereas if you, you know, um, hire your accountant or someone who just specializes in payroll, like an ADP or paycheck, you'll pay more, but they basically make it um, a lot simpler for you. Um, my guess is great, it, you know, in terms of the do-it-yourself one, but I thought it was quite easy. So if I've been getting pandemic unemployment assistance or unemployment, um, and I'm, I, 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 tell me, is that taxable income? Is that like, what of, of all the assistance that are out there, tell our audience members what they should be concerned accounting for because it seems like there's a whole patchwork of funding out there right now. Um, so if I'm just, uh, you know, taking un unemployment or pandemic unemployment assistance, are those taxable? And is there anything else I should be concerning myself with? Yeah, so the unemployment's taxable. They didn't, um, especially in the CARES Act, the rule has been it's always taxable and it's stayed that way. Um, sort of the law on what is income, um, there's a Supreme Court case that says it's any undeniable accession to wealth. So basically everything is income except like a gift or a loan um, or like reimbursement, you know, other, if you barter, if we trade and there's um, an unequal value, there's potentially income. Um, if you don't receive a 1099 form or a W-2 and you were paid money, that's still income. You know, I guess it's a, a separate question whether our friends at the government would, you know, figure it out or not. Um, and I'm not advocating anyone to, to do that, but um, their position, the government's would be that, you know, it's all income. Um, the only thing that wasn't taxable, um, well, there are a couple in the CARES Act and stimulus bills. Um, so the economic rebate payment was not taxable. Um, if you didn't receive that, you can still get it on your 2020 tax return. Like, you know, if you're 
2018 tax return or 2019 tax return, you earn too high of an income to qualify, um, but your 2020 income is dropped, it will come in as a tax credit on the return. Um, or if you didn't receive a check for you know whatever reason and you qualify in 2020, um, all of the loans, you know, um, payroll protection loans, economic injury disaster loans, none of that stuff's you know income. Um, and uh, with the I guess with the payroll protection loan, um, normally if a debt is forgiven, it's income to you. So they're you know, they exempted it, which was very nice, um, but you just don't get to deduct the expenses that, you know, you use the money for. So still, still a net gain, you know, not 100%. Yeah. Jason, let me get you to clarify that because we had that specific question for, from one of our members to pass on. Um, so obviously the loan part's not taxable, and we're hearing that the PPP grant is not taxable. What about the EIDL grant the thousand dollars per employee up to ten thousand it's not taxable but they if you have both it takes the um your forgiveness with the pp is reduced by the um grant amount of the eidl so sorry, sorry there's like way too many acronyms here but um you know so the payroll protection loan i believe is like one percent and it's a i think a five-year term now so you know, not a bad deal if you're stuck with them. Yeah, great information. And for our members, we have been recommending that you set up separate accounts with the PPP and EIDL money if you can, in order to monitor how that money is uh, spent. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with that. I got a question on, you mentioned um, credits. Um, what other credits and deductions, bells and whistles, per se, are available now that folks are in a situation where they may have applied for and received and spent their PPPs. Um, the EI, I checked the EIDL average in the state of Georgia was less than $10,000. Now, bear in mind um, that the same office uh, grants uh, loans upwards of $150,000. So the fact rate average was below $10,000 is striking um, to me. Um, so it's, it's it boggles the mind that you would want to go and has set up a separate account for something that could easily be spent within a month or two. Um, I wasn't sure you were aware of that average, Jason. Um, but surely if you got a six figure loan, which is, it seems to make more sense to have a 30 year term for a six figure loan. Cause it's almost like purchasing a house, right? Or a small condominium uh, or maybe a broom closet. I don't know in Atlanta, but, um, but so, so assuming that we've gotten through this phase and we're looking at preparing taxes next week, um, once we figure out the roadmap towards what we're going to count as a loan, uh, what will be forgiven but exempted, and which grants are going to reduce that forgiveness, what's left? Obviously, the rebate is not taxable. Gifts are not taxable. What is left in terms of tax credits or deductions that are new um, under the situation right now, under this new norm? I mean, there, there's some for businesses, but I don't know that they're really going to be applicable here. Um, you can take retirement money out. Um, if you're under age 59 and a half, there's normally a 10% penalty. The penalty is waived. And normally that distribution of money from your retirement account would be income, but they actually let you um, spread the income out for three years. And you normally have 60 days to put it back in. They extended the time to put it back in. Um, I think three years too, or, you know, I, I don't remember that time frame, but you know, you, you get a more significant period of time to unwind. It could be like an interest free loan. Um, other than that, I, I don't think there's really anything that applies. Um, that's there's, new. There's one important one we had our studios address and that was, the uh, employment tax on people who had to take time off. We had a number of people uh, in April in our industry who suddenly had kids at home, 
had trouble working, et cetera. And there was a, uh, a tax break if you paid them less than their normal salary, but kept them on payroll. And I believe that's still in place now. Is that correct? Yeah. So the Families First Act, if you have to do paid leave there, you get a tax credit um, to re recoup the, you know, the paid leave. So it offsets your payroll taxes. There's also another payroll tax credit called the employer retention credit. Um, you can't take it if you took the PPP. So most people, you know, went the PPP route, but you know, I, for instance, I represent a Chick-fil-A operator and Chick-fil-A was pretty smart. They said that none of their operators could take the PPP because they were worried about the potential PR nightmare associated with it. And so they took the, you know, employer retention credit instead. And, you know, that's not public information. So they're not getting yelled at right now. So, um, but yeah, it, you know, it, 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 I don't think it would apply to many people here. It, if you're interested, it's called the employee um, employee retention credit. The IRS has actually a pretty good website about it. All right. Well, thank you, Jason. Um, I think that wraps up our tax discussion. Is there Are there any final words you'd like to say before we move on to question and answer that I didn't cover that we, our, our audience should know about? For Oh, how about this one? How could I forget? What if I can't pay my tax? What happens if I'm in a situation where I just can't, I got to choose between rent and tax next week? What do I do? Um, government agents from the IRS show up and break your legs. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so the deadline is next week. Uh, you know, it was extended from April 15th to July 15th. You know, if you can't pay, file an extension. Um, it's an extension of time to file and not pay, but it at least kind of kicks a can down the road. The Internal Revenue Service very friendly with installment agreements if you owe less than 50000 I think we might have lost Jason for a moment uh, there mid-sentence. Um, Just so... when we talked about the IRS, he gets shut down. I see how it works. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have him come back. Uh, maybe he'll log back in and get reconnected. Um, so yeah, just when it was getting good, right? Um, but like Jason was saying, you can file an extension if you're not aware of that. Um, uh, you know, he was talking about installments as well. Jason, are you back with us? Yeah, sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> so yeah, I... um, you were saying, you were talking about installment plans. Um, if you owe less than 50,000, you can ask for one of those. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if you've done an installment plan previously, isn't there a prohibition against doing another one within the last five years or something like that? Or, or uh, definitely. So you can do an installment agreement at any amount. It's just the due diligence that the government requires is a lot less under 50. But you know, I've had clients that were on their 10th installment agreement. Um, I have some that are just perennial offenders. Um, you know. So Obviously, I, I tell people to comply with their taxes, but you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make them drink. Um, you know, they, they will, if, if the liability is you know, large enough, they'll settle it, depending upon your financial situation. Um, you know, agreement, if they have a program where you don't have to pay them anything, if, you know, if you, your money is going to like your necessary living expenses. So there are options if you know the money, you know, the world's not going to come to an end. You can definitely deal with it. I think where people screw up is they put their head in the sand and they don't deal with it, you know, so it gets worse and, you know, they do bad things to you when you, you hide. So, and, and just to clarify, you can file an extension, which will extend the deadline, kick the can till October 15th. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. That's if I had money and I couldn't pay it. I would, 100% do that. Um, they charge late filing penalties if you don't file on time, and it could be 25%, so you want to avoid that. Um, and I, sorry, oh, and my understanding is, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jason, finish. Uh, someone finish. asked if you have to pay tax on state and federal unemployment, and yeah, it's taxable. I'm gonna, it's like normal income. 
Yeah, and um, I just wanted to say if if you're using software to help you prepare, like if you're doing a DIY, you know, with with help from a software, com you know, service, um, then if you file an extension, you, at least I know in the state of Georgia, Jason, um, if you file an extension with the federal government, it, the states automatically, uh, you don't have to file a separate extension with the state. Is that right? Yeah, that's how it is in Georgia. Um, you know, I, I assume other states are similar, but I don't know for sure. So definitely yeah. take that with a disclaimer that yes, this is for Georgia, but if you're not in Georgia and also talk about what if I'm earning income uh, across state lines, that is something that we did talk about earlier, um, talking about tonight, what's that situation and how would I account for income that I earn across state lines and give me an example. Um, well, sort of how it works is you, you're a resident of one state and that state gets to tax you on your worldwide income. And then if you do business in other states, they have, if you have nexus with them, which is like a certain level of activity, um, and for some states, it's pretty low to get there. Um, you are subject to taxation on the income that you know, meets the nexus. So, you know, if you work the job, and if you're a resident of Georgia, but you, you worked a job in California or vice versa, you could be subject to tax in that state for the, the income related to that single project or job. Um, but do, do I have to physically be in California or can I just have a client in California that gives me a lot of work? Um, so depends. Yeah. <laughs> um, a probably depend on the client. I mean, look, you know, if I was working from home in Georgia, um, I would take the position that I'm only subject to Georgia tax, but if the party you're working with, you know, withholds or something, you're, you're in the position where you have to file to get the money. Um, you know, some states have rules where if you, you know, do a certain amount of activity um, with people that are located there, it could trigger taxation and every state's different. Um, you know, the, the last thing I would say is if that happens, you get a, you, you don't pay any more because, you know, my California, Georgia example, um, let's say you pay tax to California and you're a resident of Georgia, you get a tax credit in Georgia equal, you, you get an offset equal to the amount paid. So it, it's more of a like compliance, effort, like having to file returns in multiple states. So, you know, um, I like to think about like athletes, you know, literally every time they go to a visiting team, they're subject to tax in that city and or state. And, um, you know, they have a whole department that accounts for that. And I'm sure their tax return filing is a nightmare because they're filing in almost every single state, right? All right. Thank you so much. Um, so that concludes our tax discussion for the moment. Um, we are going to switch over to Q&A from the audience. So please, if you have a question, now is a good time um, to let Ginger or Andrew know uh, what is your burning question uh, that we have not covered tonight. Uh, we'll be happy to take your questions. So yeah. Ginger or Andrew. We had a number of questions in advance from members when they saw the telework, telecommuting part of this. So I'd love to throw these out to you. Please. Uh, one of the questions we got was from one of our studios. It gets insurance against there being malware on its submissions to the publishers uh, that it works with. Uh, and they, I guess, haven't checked this yet, but they are wondering if that insurance uh, still applies when their employees are working from home. Uh, and I guess on home machines. So which of our specialists would like to take the malware question? Would that be Karen or would that be Scott? No one, no one I, wants to take I see, malware. I see, I, <laughs> no, I see no, one, no one saying yes. Can we just say yes? No. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think that, yeah, I can, I can jump in on this. You know, it's really gonna, you know, on whether or not the insurance is gonna uh, cover is really going to be an issue of their insurance policy. And so you really need an insurance coverage lawyer to take a look at those policies 
Um, frequently, there's very poor coverage for cyber attacks and things of that li uh, like that. And you typically need a pr particular kind of writer for cyber insurance. And so way outside my area of expertise, I know just enough to be dangerous. And at my firm, I'm fortunate I've got a big firm with people all across the country, including many people who do insurance coverage work for policyholders who specialize in particular about cyber insurance and cyber insurance coverage. And happy to introduce somebody if they if they need to have somebody look at those policies. I, um, from from a very very high level though, and um, just you know, and this is not advice, obviously, and obviously I'm not either specialized in cybersecurity law, but it seems to be a, a just a practical uh, CYA matter that if and again, this is why you got to go see a lawyer for a real answer. But if I'm being, uh, if I have no choice but to change my my place of work um, because of act beyond my control, you know, our office is closed. Uh, I have nowhere else to go. We have to do the work from here. Um, it seems to make a, a good a good sense to uh, to exercise caution, right? And to and again, what Karen was saying about you know using the proper apps, reasonable risk. All of these things have to be have to be tailored for your particular situation. So I think the lesson here is, if you have a specific concern, that you certainly try to connect with a lawyer who specializes uh, in this particular matter in a cybersecurity or insurance capacity um, to get a very specific answer. You uh, definitely want to uh, make sure that you take care to do that um, because this panel, we can only give general information. Um, we didn't talk about workers' comp. I don't think we're going to we're gonna have an opportunity. I'm going to see what other questions we have, but that did trigger my memory on that. Andrew did, or Ginger? We did have a general question about business insurance. What do you need to include if you're having workers work from home? Um, again, yeah, um, I mean, I'm, go ahead, Scott. You know, the workers' comp issue is one that's pretty um, concerning, and it has been concerning for a lot of a lot of companies. Which is one of the reasons why, before the pandemic, very few, you know, many companies didn't allow workers to work from home. You know, what happens if you're, you know, sitting at at home and you trip over your cat as you're getting up? from your computer to go to your printer to get something off the printer. Is that workers comp? And, you know, how do you know that the person didn't trip over their cat at 11 o'clock at night when they were getting up to get a bowl of ice cream from watching Netflix? Those kinds of issues are nightmare issues for employers because, you know, employers wanna control their risks or minimize their risks. And, and those are issues that you've really gotta be careful about. Uh, I think you got to talk to your broker, make sure your policies are, are up to date and covered and get as comfortable as you can with that you're dealing with the risks that you're now facing if you're going to be having some percentage of your workforce telecommuting. And you want to make sure that your workers' comp policies are properly adjusted. Uh, you know, most office work is pretty safe work. It's usually pretty low rated. Um, Workers' compensation insurance your premium is usually a percentage of your payroll or percentage increases depending on the dangers of the work. So roofers usually have the highest workers' compensation risk uh, premium rate because people fall off roofs all the time. Um, people who are operating computers and, and you know office work usually is among the lowest because you know paper cuts are the, usually the most serious injury. Um, I'm oversimplifying it and being a little bit glib, but sort of that's how you have to kind of look at the world. Um, and you just want to make sure that you're appropriately measuring for your risk. And then, uh, you know, as with everything else, if you've got people working from home, you're going to have to have appropriate policies, which most people didn't have time to adopt when the pandemic hit and everybody went home. Um, so you probably what are those policies, policies as well. Scott? Tell it, tell us, tell us about those because Karen gave us a nice well, little list yeah. earlier. I want to hear some more. Yeah, 
you know, California is a special place to be an employer or an employee. So a lot of it won't apply to people who are else out outside of California. But, um, you know, you want to have policies, you know, with respect to, you know, in California, you know, the hours that people are going to work, the permission, you know, to get to work overtime. You know, in California, you want to document that people are taking their meal periods and their rest periods. If you're using people's uh, personal equipment, you may want to have reimbursement policies to reimburse them for their use of their computer and the internet and their cell phone and their office phone and things like that. You're going to want to, you know, update your sexual harassment policies because if you're going to be doing Zoom meetings and people are working from their home, maybe they're not dressed as appropriately as they would if they were coming into the office. You want to make sure that they're, you know, that they're not showing up on their you know, Zoom meetings undressed or some level of undress. There was early on, there was a judge who had to ad admonish a lawyer who was attending a video hearing in court. I think it was in Florida. It happened in like late February, early March, because the lawyer had the, decided to uh, take the video hearing from his bed or her bed. I forget if it was a male or a female. And they hadn't properly gotten dressed. And the judge admonished them that a video court hearing was nonetheless a court hearing. And he expected people in his courtroom to dress appropriately and not take the beating in bed. It was, it was all over all the legal publications. It was quite funny. So you want to have some semblance of policies to make sure that people are behaving professionally. Right, and and certainly the challenges that of people working from home certainly are uh, lending to uh, additions and amendments and modifications of previous policies and creations of whole new ones. So um, it's a really interesting area. I'm excited to see where we are six months from now. Um, so do we have any additional questions from our audience members or from your members, Ginger or Andrew? Um, yes, I added them to the chat. Oh, I do not have it. Oh, there it is. I just, I got to scroll up. Um, since hardware and connectivity are essential for remote work, what might a contractor moving to remote expect in securing these? So when you say securing these, can you, so I you mean as... Yeah, it says um, they, they asked uh, further that, like, should it be responsibility of the client or the studio oh, or the business well, to provide these? So we just talked about a reimbursement policy. I think Scott just mentioned that. If um, Scott, do you want to elaborate a little bit on the reimbursement policy? Yeah. You know, in California, again, there's the law is a little weird. In California, there's a court case with respect to cell service where... Um, the court held that even though the employee already had a, you know, unlimited t cell phone policy, you know, cell phone plan, that the employer had to reimburse the employee the fair value of the, of the use of their cell phone for making work calls. You know, you could see it from both perspectives. The employee wasn't, you know, the employer already had the phone. They weren't paying any more because they had to make a few calls for their employer, but the court said the employer shouldn't get a free ride. Um, I don't think that's the law in all the, in all the states, but you can see the concept there and you can generalize that concept. So um, in addition, you don't have to pay the full cost of the cell phone, right? It's just the reasonable value. And I think you just sort of have to look to see what you're being required to uh, what you're requiring the employees to provide, or if you're the, the remote worker, what you're being asked to provide, and, and you know, ask for a reasonable value of those services. You know, your internet service, if you're paying $40 a month for internet, and you know, you're working a third of the day, then maybe a third of the day is a third of the value. If you have to upgrade your internet service from you know, dial up to something higher speed because you have to do video conferences all day long, then maybe you get a little bit more. I just literally just got off the phone with a law firm in LA and they are paying all their non-exempt employees $100 a month, basically as, a, as an expense reimbursement to allowance for their cell phone, their video, and, you know, and the like. We had an interesting situation with one of our studios 
where they had all their software in the studio was licensed and legal. But when their people went home and were working on their own machines, one of their people was suddenly working on unlicensed software. Mm -hmm. And they had to expand their site licenses to cover that person's own machine because they weren't taking the, the computer out of the studio. So bizarre things mm -hmm. like that have certainly popped up that uh, have to be added to expenses. And, you know, I would have argued because um, I've actually dealt with those type of licenses before. I would have argued, well, that machine is not operational right now. Let's just take it off that machine and transition it to this machine since no one is using it right now. Um, I, I mean, substitute it. Can we substitute it? The, you know, plug in a different um, machine. Maybe that's possible. Um, but, you know, there's always a you got to get that tough negotiator on the phone, right? For, for, you know, get the secretary on the phone. They're the toughest negotiators. Um, but as far as the uh, or, or question- Or get Lee on the phone, apparently. <laughs> uh, as far as the question on intellectual property, somebody wanted to know, what, what rights do I give away if I post work on social media? And then they specified Instagram. So I'm going to answer this question within the context of Instagram because- uh, so it's just not a one size fits all anymore with social media. There's so many different kinds. Um, so if I'm talking about Instagram, what rights do I give away? So, so generally when we're talking about stuff we're posting on Instagram, it might be creative stuff or it might be, uh, not creative, but more personal stuff like a selfie. Um, so, you know, and I say not creative, uh, in the sense of, um, it, it really depends on photography, you know, obviously, uh, people post more than just pictures on Instagram, they post artwork, um, they post designs, um, they post little movies, right? Uh, I think, um, they probably, there's probably more that they can post that I'm just not aware of because I'm not cool and I don't hang out on Instagram. But if you can register a copyright at the copyright office in your work or a collection of uh, works, and let's talk about publication really quickly without getting too much into the weeds. Um, but publication, most people think about publication as uh, a performance. Uh, and, and I say that within the context of the copyright law. Um, just putting something up on your portfolio on the web um, does not constitute a legal publication. A legal publication in the context of when you go to register your rights in a copyright eligible work, um, means that I am selling it. I am actively selling prints, I'm selling downloads, I'm selling it, um, or I'm licensing it to a third party or another party to sell it. So usually uh, if, you know, I'll give an example of, uh, you know, these, if I'm distributing it through a, a middleman, um, like uh, there's a really cool company called Mind's Eye Creative that I follow, um, and they just threw up a shop for artists. And so they're a middleman now. So I'm going to send them my stuff and they're going to throw it up into their shop to sell it to the public. So that when that stuff gets thrown up into the shop, when it passes that inspection and it's out there, that's my publication date. So long story short, if I'm just throwing stuff up on Instagram, that is not a legal publication. But what it does is it's no longer private, depending on your settings. I might have a privacy setting, um, but it's still not private for the th thousands of people who follow me, even though I'm a private account. You, you hear where I'm coming from? So the general rule of thumb is if it's a, a work that's eligible for copyright, meaning it's a graphic or it's a visual artwork, or it could be a photograph, um, or it might be a motion picture short or an anim animated, uh, you know, some type of, um, yeah, I'm going to get into the weeds, but, you know, with the animation business, I know that you guys obviously have um, characters, motion graphics, um, all types of really cool creative stuff. Um, you know, you can register some of these things as collections. Uh, you can, and, and again, you can do a collection of unpublished works which is usually a great, the best bang for your buck. 
Uh, it depends though. It depends on how many authors. So I'm not going to go on and on, but the long story short is, do I give away rights when I'm posting my stuff up onto Instagram? The best rule of thumb is to register before you post stuff that you can sell. Okay. Register it. It's so cheap to register your work. And if you're just throwing stuff up to see what sticks, to see, hey, maybe this is going to be something I want to sell. Maybe this is a print that's getting a lot of likes. Then I'll register it. Then I'll invest in it. Sure, that's fine. Um, but don't expect any privacy. That's the main thing. You know, if I'm concerned about my stuff being out there um, and and having a some level of privacy, my privacy rights. I have no privacy rights if I'm putting stuff out on Instagram. Uh, even if I have a private account, if I have followers, um, there's, there's, there's a level of privacy that I have within those groups, obviously. Um, but I still think uh, you got to exercise caution and common sense. Don't put anything out in the public that you don't want publicized. Um, and I think that answers the question, uh, except for is Instagram, when you say they, I'm assuming you mean Instagram. Is Instagram allowed to license your work out to some other company? That's an easy answer. Uh, you're not going to like my answer, but I'm going to tell you to look at the policy. We've been talking a lot about policies tonight. Policies are how companies cover their butt. If they're CYA, okay? If it's in the policy, if it's in the user guide, the user policy, remember we talked about terms of use earlier with Karen? Um, if I'm using Instagram or Facebook or any of these any of these uh, companies that their whole business is built on user generated content, that means they're making money off of you and your need to, to use their services. So that is a, a major, major issue because you're signing up for uh, quite a bit and you don't necessarily spend all the time you should be spending reading the fine print. So I suggest if you're concerned with Instagram that you go read that user policy. If you're using PayPal, read their policies. These policies get updated every other month. And right now with the pandemic, they're getting, a, a lot of policies are getting updated. Um, I know that, um, so if you're using all of these services online, whether it's to market your stuff, sell your stuff, or get a middleman to do it for you, read the policies, read all of it. And if you don't understand something, talk to a lawyer and get them to explain it to you so you know what you're signing up for. That's my 50 minute answer. We have well, one I think more that, on the bottom. Oh, okay. Um, I don't see if uh, um, so maybe you added it's, one. It's just a, Can uh, a company mandate their employees must turn on their camera on Zoom for meetings? Can you not turn on the camera? So that's, um, would that be a privacy question, Karen, with turning on the camera? I don't really know. I, I think it's more has to do with what can an employer re require of an employee when they're working from home? Is there, I know there's a certain amount of surveillance and monitoring that employees at working from home may have to put up with, but how far that goes, I don't know. What I about think it depends. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, you know, there's, um, it's also going to depend on the employer's policies, you know, that we're going to want you to attend these meetings, we may need you to attend in person. And then you're going to have, have issues, perhaps that you may need to have some accommodations if people have some other kind of disability or, or something. Um, you know, part of the reason why people have, you know, we're not having a conference call here we're having a you know this uh, video uh, conference is because it's more interactive you get to get a better gauge of what's going on and you want to make sure people are actually attending and paying attention you know and if somebody can't turn their their camera on for some reason you're gonna to want to know why you know are they working for some you know are they actually working somewhere else you know are they holding down two jobs drawing two paychecks when they're supposed to be working full-time for both of the companies mm -hmm. and the other one doesn't want them really freelancing, you know, or, or uh, uh, you know, moonlighting. 
So, you know, you know, there are good reasons why a company might want you, you know, visually present. You know, um, I'm wearing a hat for a reason because my hair isn't exactly where I want it to be. Uh, and there's, so there's reasons why people might not want to be on camera, but you know, most people are showing up for, for things on video. I get it a little bit, you know, my secretary almost never turns her camera on because she hates to be photographed. Um, she will literally run away. If you have a camera, she'll literally run away. Um, she's been my secretary for a very long time and she's very good, so I put up with it. But, you know, she never turns her camera on when we have video conferences. Um, maybe she'll turn it on for a second so we can see that she's really there. Um, but, you know, I think that a company can, um, you know, under, you know, subject to certain limitations, make you turn your camera on for, for video conferences. Um, if that's all of the questions tonight, we're, we're probably out of time and we would ask that anybody whose question was not answered to please um, reach out to us. Um, Ginger uh, has a slide with our contact information um, that she might put up and uh, if you don't get the information off of the slide, certainly get in touch with your executive directors. Uh, Ginger Tantavitang at ASIFA or uh, Andrew Greenberg at GGDA, and they will let us know. Um, happy to answer and happy to pass on answers. We have one more session coming up uh, on August 6th, I think. Um, yes, that is correct. With that said, uh, you know, we're going to be uh, having a great time talking about future uh, upsets, future stay-at-home orders, future waves. And uh, we would love for you to join us. We'll, uh, I think the registration page will be sent out pretty soon. Um, hopefully you can join us. Ginger and Andrew, did you have announcements you wanted to deliver for your uh, organization? Yes, so the page is already live uh, for the session three. And um, like Lee said, uh, it's about the planning for the next wave. Uh, topics covered will be living, uh, setting up ACD, living wills, financial POAs and wills, anticipated legislation such as uh, HEROES, worker compensation, stimulus payment, and or universal basic income, as well as oh, the force majeure clause, uh, important for future contracts and reinforcing workspace and workforce. Um, Andrew, did you? Yeah, absolutely. Great stuff tonight. Thank you, everybody. For our GGJ members, remember that July 21st, we're going to have, uh, working with Skillshot Media and others, we'll have our Voter Gamer event. Uh, this will probably be on the front page of Twitch. So if you are a streamer, especially a Fortnite streamer, great chance to get publicity. Go ahead and email us at info at GGDA if you want to be involved. And earlier on, I already posted our COVID back to work guidelines, leading with the uh, phrase, if you don't have to go back into the studio, don't. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> yes, and uh, for uh, ASIFA folks, uh, if anybody's interested, we have our online community going on. We have uh, Monday and Wednesday, we do a watch party and also a sketch meeting uh, on our Discord channel. And every Tuesday, we have a Q&A, sometimes quick, sometimes not so quick. So join us on our um, uh, Facebook group. The information should be inside of the live stream below, along with all those speakers' um, information as well, too.